Hello and welcome to today's PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada, the Canadian Space Agency, and the Institute for Earth and Space Exploration. My name is Stacey Joyce and I will be your host. If you're joining us live, remember that you can ask questions anytime by clicking Q&A near the bottom of your screen and typing your questions into the pop-up window. I will relay these questions to our guests during the Q&A section. So if you have a question in the middle of the presentation, feel free to type that out in the Q&A, and then I'll just sort of queue that up and we'll ask the questions all at the end. Today's guest is Dr. Parshati Patel. She is the Educational Outreach and Communication Specialist at the Institute for Earth and Space Exploration, and that is at Western University in London, Ontario. Thanks for joining us, Parshati. I will let you take it from here. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here today again. Um, I am going to be talking about Titan and impact craters. Um, this is not the research area um, that I generally work with. However, um, the person who was gonna present it today, Jahanvi, um, she was six, I'm taking over uh, for her. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, I have uh, you know some knowledge about impact craters and Titan, and it's really exciting to learn about that particular uh, moon. So if you have not looked at, at Saturn in recent times with a telescope, uh, you could actually see Titan uh, through a very, very small telescope. Um, it is the second largest moon uh, of, um, in our solar system, largest for the Saturn, uh, the planet Saturn. Uh, but it's really interesting to see uh, that, you know, when you look through the telescope, you are actually able to see Saturn um, you know, even, even through a small backyard telescope that you might have. Um, and it looks something like this. It's a very, very uh, small moon compared to a very large planet like Saturn. Uh, it's actually uh, around 2.5 times, um, you know, if we were to create 2.5 um, Titans, we can actually create one Earth. So, you know, it's only 2.5 times smaller um, than Earth, so uh, it's it's bigger than our moon, and it's actually bigger than Mercury. Uh, so it's very interesting to see that there is a moon in our solar system uh, that is bigger than uh, the the Mercury, one of the planets in our solar system. It's pretty uh, pretty uh, neat. Uh, it was actually discovered in 1655, uh, so for <laughs> quite a while it has been known, um, and it was discovered by a Dutch astronomer. Kristen Huygens, and uh, <clears throat> you will see um, that uh, you know his legacy has been lived on. And I'll talk a little bit about how uh, we have you know dedicated um, a mission in his name. Um, what's really interesting is that Titan is pretty unique compared to uh, any of the moons that we know in our solar system, including our own. Is that it has a very dense and thick atmosphere. It's actually denser uh, than the one on Earth, and it looks something like this. It's you know, very, very yellowish orange and blue. So um, it's interesting to see that there's another system in our solar system that has a thick atmosphere. It is actually composed mostly of nitrogen and, uh, and a little bit of methane. And I'll talk about methane uh, in a bit, but you know, we here on Earth also have nitrogen um, as, as a very large component of our atmosphere. Um, and you know, in, in Titan also, you can see that Titan is, uh, uh, has a large component of nitrogen. Uh, however, it's the smaller components that are actually making really big difference in its, uh, in its chemistry and the atmosphere. Uh, what's also very neat about Titan is that it is the only place other than Earth in the solar system where you have liquid lakes. So it has stable uh, liquid on its surface, which you know we don't know of many other places in our solar system. Uh, we know of some places that we think would have it, but we, you know, we need confirmation. And you will see, we actually have pictures from the surface of Titan. Uh, so it's pretty neat to see that there are lakes on, uh, on Titan. And you know, this is kind of a, an, a radar image of, the, of the, one of the lakes in the polar regions. And uh, you know, it's, it's not like a liquid lake, like if you were to you know, drive to, uh, to Lake Ontario or Lake Erie, um, it's actually made of methane. And I mentioned that methane was, um, you know, one of the components of the atmosphere. And so um, it's pretty interesting to see how the methane in the atmosphere uh, kind of, you know, uh, precipitates into almost like a rain and then has uh, liquid lakes are created on the surface. Um, it has what we call a methane cycle, uh, just like what we have here on Earth, like a water cycle. Um, so, you know, you would have um, all the methane lakes kind of um, 
you know, evaporate into the atmosphere. Uh, if the season is right, it condenses down into um, and form um, big lakes. So it's pretty interesting. Um, however, because it's so far away from the sun, um, it's actually very, very cold. Um, so it's around negative 179 degrees on the surface. So that's, you know, 179, but in negative. It's pretty cold, colder than, you know, most of the places that we know here on Earth. So uh, it's, it's pretty interesting that you can actually find, you know, lakes like these on the surface, but also have clouds of methane and ethane in, in the atmosphere. So it's very similar to Earth in many ways. Uh, and I'll talk about why we look at Earth as an analog to, to this particular, uh, particular uh, uh, you know, system in, in, our, in, our, uh, in our source system. <coughs> Apologize. Um, we also, you know, we're very interested in studying Saturn and, and its moons. So in, in uh, 1997, we actually launched um, Cassini-Huygens uh, spacecraft. So this is what the spacecraft looks like. Um, and it was interesting because, uh, you know, other than um, some uh, satellites that had gone by before, we hadn't actually studied all the possible, uh, you know, moons that we know of in the Sa uh, Saturn system and Saturn itself, its rings, et cetera, before Cassini-Huygens came into, um, you know, studying the system. So uh, between 2004 and 2017, Cassini was studying uh, Saturn, its rings, and including Titan. Um, so what ended up happening that when they des uh, designed this mission, they actually had a lander in, in addition to a satellite. The satellite is something that goes around a planet or a moon. Um, and so they, they included a lander that would actually land on Titan. And because we, you know, we had known about Titan for a very, very long time, um, we knew that Titan is pretty unique because of its atmosphere. And so we wanted to learn uh, what's underneath those, uh, you know, thick, dense atmosphere. You can imagine, um, you know, if you were to go to Venus, which also has a very, very thick atmosphere, and try to look at the surface, unless you have a certain technology like radar, you won't be actually able to look through the clouds. Um, and so, you know, for them to send a lander, that was a pretty unique um, unique thing because now we would be able to see under the clouds and what it looks like on the surface. So here's an artist a conception. So this is not a real image, but this is what uh, the Huygens lander would have looked like when it landed on, on the surface of, of Titan. Um, and the idea was uh, for it to land and, you know, look around and see what's around it, what's on the surface. But it also took a lot of measurements while it was trying to land on Titan. So it, it looked at the temperature, it looked at, you know, what kind of atmospheric components there are, as well as, you know, what the surface looked like around where it landed. And so we actually got first pictures of, you know, what the, the area looks like. And these are the real images of, of, of the area where Huygens landed. So on this side, you have um, an image that was received from um, the lander. You see it's very hazy because there's a lot of haze on Titan. But what you do see is there are, you know, some pebbles uh, that you can see. Um, what they then did was they actually added contrast because it's easier for our eyes to, you know, look at pictures that have more contrast. So they added contrast. This, this is the same image. And you can start seeing more rocks, um, you know. And, and these rocks are actually made of water ice. Um, you know, you can imagine this place is super cold. It's minus 179 degrees Celsius on the surface, uh, you have material that starts behaving like rocks and pebbles. And, and you know, you can also see that there is a lot of sandy kind of material there as well. Um, so it landed in, you know, a pretty, pretty good region to be able to see um, what's around it. So, you know, it's, it's one of those places where other than, other than our moon, this is the only other kind of moon that we had landed. Uh, so it's pretty interesting that we had images from, from such a faraway place. Um, what Jahanvi is particularly interested in studying um, is, is kind of the surface uh, geology. So, you know, what kind of processes actually happen on this planet where it has, it has clouds, it has winds, it has rain, um, just like, you know, that of, of our, 
of our earth, but in a different way. It's not water cycle. It doesn't rain water. Um, it's, you know, it has, it has wind just like earth, but it, it behaves differently because also it's very cold fair. Um, what's interesting is that, um, is that uh, Titan actually has what we think is called cryo volcano. So it's an ice volcano, um, just like how we would have, you know, volcano that erupts, like, you know, that, that basically puts out magma um, instead of molten rock that we get here on earth, you would actually get methane and water ice and ethane coming out of it. So that's pretty neat that, you know, we're able to find something like that on a, on a system um, a little bit further away from, from earth than we would like. And so here are some of the pictures that we have actually taken of um, impact craters on, on these, uh, on Titan. Um, and if you don't know what an impact crater looks like, um, it's, it's basically, you know, when you have uh, objects uh, like small rocks or big rocks that come and hit, you know, places like Earth, Moon, any solid surface, uh, what it would do is it would, you know, come through the atmosphere if it has one, if it doesn't, it, you know, strikes the ground. And what you end up with is something like this, um, you know, it's kind of a hole in a ground. Um, uh, you know, scientific word for that, you know, for the after that process would be crater. And, and this is actually a Behringer crater in Arizona. Um, this one is a very, very young crater, only 50,000 years old. Um, but it's pretty interesting to see that we have evidence of things like that here on Earth. Um, but you can find, you know, evidence of craters all over. You can find evidence of craters on the moon, Mercury, you know, many other places in other uh, moons of the solar, in the solar system as well. Um, you know, here is the Copernicus crater, which is very well known. If you have a small telescope, you're actually able to see the crater uh, on the moon. So what um, Johanvi is trying to study is she's trying to compare what we see here on Earth um, and, and, you know, uh, how craters here on Earth behave, how they erode over time, because, you know, we have similar things like that of Titan, as I said before, you know, we have wind, we have clouds, we have, you know, liquid that falls from the, um, from the, these clouds and Earth, it's water, on Titan, it's, you know, methane. Um, so they, she's trying to understand what happens to these kinds of craters here on Earth and then try and see if that is the similar process if that happens on, on, on Titan. It's very hard for us to get to Titan as humans, you know, it's a very, very, probably in a few decades or, you know, 50, 60 years, we might be able to travel to Titan. But for now, we're able to travel very easily around Earth. So we use analogs or we use craters here on Earth to see what happens to them and kind of compare them to uh, Titan without actually going to Titan. So that's a pretty neat, uh, neat area of study uh, that a lot of people, uh, you know, are undertaking, including Jahanvi. So we're going to switch gears, but still continue about talking, you know, going to other places. So we talked about, you know, maybe going to Titan in 50, 60 years, or maybe a few decades. It depends how great we do at technology. Uh, but, you know, we, we humans have been to the moon, um, but the idea is that we're going to return to the moon um, very soon. Uh, so in the next decade, uh, NASA is actually planning to send um, a, create a small uh, uh, space station around the moon. And then that's going to help us to send, you know, uh, humans to moon again. And, and you know, uh, and, and the interesting part is that uh, Canada is taking part in it. Canada is known for our robotics uh, when it comes to going to space. We have, you know, contributed Canada Arm. And so we're going to be contributing Canada Arm 3 um, to that uh, space station that uh, NASA is calling Lunar Gateway uh, because it's almost like a gateway to space or to further explore the solar system. And, and what CSA is now doing is they're, you know, investing a lot of money and research in building the Canada arm, the technologies that we're going to need on the moon. But at the same time, this is a very long plan. And so by the time you all of you guys are going to be in the workforce. This is when it's going to be implemented. So the Canadian Space Agency is actually looking for junior astronauts because by the time astronauts are going to be going to the moon, you guys are going to be eligible to apply. So um, they have created a bunch of activities that you can try, and we're going to look at one of those here today. And you know, you can actually, if you do three activities in a, from different streams, you're able to put your name in the draw where you will be able to, uh, you know, try and, and 
um, get, go to space camp, uh, space training camp at the Canadian Space Agency. That's, that's pretty cool. And, and, you know, one of the activities that I'm explaining to you today, if you just do that one activity, uh, you're actually able to put your, your name or like your class and your school's name in a draw uh, where you might get a visit from a uh, Canadian Space Agency astronaut or space expert, which I think is pretty cool. I wish I had that opportunity when I was growing up uh, is to, you know, meet uh, scientists from the Canadian Space Agency. So one of the things that I always like to highlight is that, you know, when you talk about space, people think about astronauts as kind of the people doing space, but there are a lot of peop different people uh, whose research is connected to uh, the space field. You know, you could be an astrophysicist and study space, so you could be a medical doctor and study how, uh, what happens to the body when, when humans are in space. You could be a geologist and study rocks from moons and other places. But you could also be a mathematician or an engineer and work in space domain. So there's tons of different fields uh, that are available. And I always like to highlight some of those um, here because it's very interesting to see where you could go with space. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to quickly go through one of these activities. It's one of my favorite activities. Um, it's called Dragon's Den. And it's just like the show that you see on TV. Uh, you are actually uh, given, you know, uh, four different panels that you have to pitch to. So the idea is that you, you know, if you are pitching to an astronaut panel, the idea is to develop um, uh, something for an astronaut. So it could be something that the astronaut could use, uh, help them work, uh, or even study in space. And you come up with this idea, and then you pitch it to a panel of astronauts. And then, you know, they have to, they have to look at a few different things. They have to look at if whatever you came up with, um, does is it practical to have that in space is it you know uh small enough to carry to space and uh, does it does it have very many applications um and you know uh when you were thinking about developing any kind of activity or an idea to pitch to people you have to ensure that you know that there is always a possibility of using known technology but in a newer and different way so th some things to consider if you're planning you know um to think of an idea and pitching it to an astronaut panel um i love this particular activity it has four different panels and how you can actually take the same idea and find a way to actually pitch to all four different panels um so the first panel is the astronaut panel um and then you have an engineering panel so you know you can come up with a technology uh, that can help uh, a mission. It could be anything. It could be a space telescope. It could be, you know, something that can help astronauts on the International Space Station. It could be a rover that you send, or you know, or, or something that goes to a moon or or an asteroid. Um, and what you have to do is you have to pitch it to um, to a team of scientists and engineers from the Canadian Space Agency. And the idea here is to either use the existing technology from Earth and try and apply to space, or you know, think about something that will help future explorers so you know if you're going to the moon think about a technology that could actually help uh, these astronauts explore moon or, or even mars so you know when you're pitching to an engineer you're thinking about all the different um science and the engineering components that goes in developing this technology um and one really neat thing about this activity is that you know you you can use the same idea and pitch it to different people but the way you tell them is going to be completely different astronauts would really care about how it's helpful to them engineers and scientists would really care about how things work okay so you have to think about those things when you're developing these pitches um, the next and actually one of my most favorite ones is pitching to a panel of politicians uh, you know they really want to understand uh, why they should invest money in space technology and it's kind of onto you to convince them that a this technology is amazing you should invest in it and the Canadians should be investing a certain amount of money in, 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 in the space um, area. And so you have to think about how your technology is going to be helpful to people here on Earth um, and how investing you know, money in space projects is, is not only helpful for people here on Earth, but also allows us to explore space in many ways. Okay. And then last but not the least, uh, and actually the most interesting panel, um, very recently we have had tons of private industries that have come up um, in, in the space area. So for example, SpaceX or Boeing um, or Virgin Atlantic that are planning to send you know, uh, rockets to space. So you have to come up with an idea where 
you know, again, it could be similar idea to the other ones, or you can come up with a completely different idea where you pitch to a panel of CEOs who have lots and lots of money to invest, okay, in a certain kind of idea. It could be, again, a technology or something to build, but you have to think about, you know, what is the interest of CEOs. They have a lot of money, but they always want to make something that makes them richer. So you have to think about a technology that can profit a lot. Uh, so maybe you built something for space, but then you can apply it here on Earth. So then, you know, it makes more profit. Um, so think about the resources that space has to offer us and how they can help uh, you know, make the CEOs richer in that way, you know, they will be more interested in actually uh, investing in your technology that you have come up with or your idea. And then also think about how private industry has gained, uh, you know, such momentum in, in space exploration. So, so if you think about those things, it will be very interesting to, uh, to, you know, pitch your idea to, to the panel. Okay, so it's a pretty interesting, my favorite activity out of all of the ones that Junior Astronauts has. Uh, so I hope you guys try out. If you already have any of these ideas, I would love to listen to them. Thank you. It's now time to choose your panel. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to leave this up here um, before we can take questions. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for, for letting us know so much about Titan and also about this great activity. Um, I was trying to already think of what I what I would pitch. What could what could I come up with? Um, our first question comes from Ms. McDonald's grade sixes in Calgary. They're wondering how Mercury can still be considered a planet if there's a moon that's larger in size. So you said Titan is larger than Mercury, but Titan is a moon, and Mercury, even though it's smaller, is a planet. So how does that work? So that's actually uh, very much dependent on our definition of a planet. So a planet has to go around the star or a sun. So that's what Mercury does. And it doesn't matter, you know, uh, it has, there's a threshold of size of what size objects could be considered a planet. And so, you know, Mercury meets that threshold. If we were to pick Titan from around Saturn and put it, let's say, between Venus and Earth, and it's going around the sun, then Titan would be a planet. However, because it's going around Saturn, which is a planet, it is called a moon, just like our moon, the Luna. So it's, uh, it's where it's located and what it's, it is uh, going around is kind of the most important um, aspect here. Okay. And our next question comes from Mr. Duncan's class in Angus, Ontario. They're grade fives there. Uh, they're wondering, uh, how far away is Titan and what is the gravity like? Mm -hmm. So Titan is, uh, because it's only 2.5 times smaller than Earth, so it, the gravity would be that much times less. Uh, what's really interesting is that because it's going around Saturn, it's actually, that's how far it is, uh, you know, from Earth to Saturn. Um, it goes around Saturn um, in, you know, in, a, in almost circular shape. Generally, most of these are a little bit uh, longer than circular, or what we like to call almost oval shapes. It would look something like this. Um, but, you know, the distance remains the same depending, you know, there's little difference depending if it's closer to the Earth or, or on the other side of Saturn, um, but it's to the distance of Saturn. So uh, pretty interesting, uh, you know, that the distance between Earth, Earth and Saturn um, is kind of the similar distance between Earth and Titan as well. Okay. Uh, and next, uh, Liam from Mr. Duncan's class. That first question came from Ethan. Uh, Liam is wondering, what are the chances of life on Titan? And then Aiden is wondering if people could live on Titan. So what are the chances that there's already life and, and what uh, could, pe could people live there? Yeah, so uh, one of the reasons why scientists are so interested in Titan is because, you know, things like methane and ethane are uh, kind of the material that form the building blocks of life here on Earth. So they have organic molecules. These are similar to what you know, er, uh, life here on Earth would have formed from. And this is one of the reasons like scientists like Jahan, we are interested in this is because you know, if you find those simple building blocks, you can start thinking about, oh, even this is so cold out there, 
is there a possibility of some form of life that maybe we don't see here on earth uh, could possibly live there, you know? Um, we certainly don't know. We have only sent one lander there, so we only have a very limited amount of information about Titan. Um, all we are now getting is from, you, you know, big telescopes like Hubble. Um, so we would definitely need a little bit more information and maybe a visit to Titan uh, to be able to figure out whether or not it has some kind of life that we don't know exists here on Earth. It doesn't look like there is anything similar to what we have here on Earth right now. Um, but again, we don't know, you know, life could maybe come in different things that different forms that we don't even know. Um, whether or not we can live there, live there, um, that is a great question. Um, it's pretty cold, as I said, you know, minus 179 degrees. If we can find a way um, to A, shield ourselves from the radiation of Saturn, because just like Sun, Saturn also has radiation. It's not as strong as Sun's radiation, but it's because that Titan is very close to the Sun, that radiation would affect us um, in some shape or form. And so if we can figure that out, we, you know, we could potentially build ourselves kind of domes that would protect us from the methane rain that is falling on the, on, on the surface. Um, and potentially we could live there. Uh, but definitely we need, to, we need to be able to understand Titan a little bit more before we can figure out whether or not that's a possibility. Okay. Next, uh, we have a question from Caden, who's a grade six in Ms. Bridger's class. Um, wondering if the moon will ever become a tourist attraction. Um, maybe in a few decades, <laughs> you know, we have private industry that is wanting to, um, I was reading an article, I think yesterday day before yesterday, where uh, one of the private industries want to just have rockets that actually fly off every day in just like, you know, how flights take off every other minute, uh, they want to have rockets that do that. So, you know, if you asked me 10 years ago, like I would be like, I eh, know maybe, you know, that's kind of like a long lived dream, but I think it's a possibility that in the near future and like in our lifetime, we would have hotels and stuff like that on, on moon and Mars. Like it won't be very far fetched um, given the, the pace at which we are going, the technologies uh, expanding in a way that I think we should be able to do that, you know, in maybe 50, 60 years, if not anytime sooner. Great. And next I have a question from Glen Park Public School in Toronto. Um, they are wondering how different things react in space, like fire. Mm -hmm. So one thing to remember that, um, you know, fire uh, here obviously takes oxygen when it tries to light, light up. Um, we don't have that in space. Space is vacuum. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, when we watch movies and stuff, uh, people show like this loud bang that is happening in space or you can hear the sound. Um, sound generally requires or, you know, material generally requires a medium. And because it's vacuum, you generally don't get that. You have to go to surfaces of uh, planets or moons, um, have thick atmospheres to have material actually interact and, um, and you know, uh, do the chemistry that you actually see here on Earth in, in, you know, in, in our neighborhood. Um, what's really interesting is though, that when you form planets and when you form stars, you have this basic ingredient like dust and gas, you know, and they are able to actually, because of gravity and the kind of material that made it of, they're actually able to stick together and form things like planets and stars. Um, however, that is all to do a lot with gravity and the material um, than to actually the medium that it's using. The medium is still the vacuum of space. So it doesn't really help them with a lot. Um, but that's a great question. It's very hard to, you know, visualize fire and things like that in space or even, you know, speaking to each other um, because there is no medium like, like air to transport uh, or, or, you know, trans transfer the vibrations like what I'm talking to you right now. Yeah. Really good question. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Duncan's class is wondering if there are any valuable minerals on Titan. That question comes from Mason. Uh, we know that there are, um, you know, methane and ethane, and there is water ice pebbles, um, but that's how far we know. We know they're made of like organic molecules. Um, as we said, we don't know much about it. Like very little information that we have is from Huygens lander that landed and some from the Cassini uh, spacecraft that was, you know, going around 
uh, Titan. But that's how far that we know, you know, we really, really need a mission to, um, to Titan to be able to do that. And I don't know if you knew, um, but we, Canada are part of what's the next mission to Titan It's called Dragonfly. And it's literally like, a, not a dragon, but it's, it's a drone uh, that is gonna be on Titan. And that's gonna be our next, it, it was actually announced last year and it's gonna be our next mission to Titan. And we're hoping that that mission is gonna help us to understand uh, Titan a little bit more and kind of figure out what it's made of in more detail and what kind of material and minerals are available on the surface. So if we ever go to Titan, you know, kind of utilizing what's available there. And is there a plan right now? Ahmed was wondering when that, uh, that next mission to Titan might be. Um, it's, uh, it's still in, you know, the conception stage has been passed. So it's going to be late 2020s to early 2030s. Okay. It still takes a long time to get to Titan or places like Saturn and Jupiter. So, you know, if they like, for example, Cassini uh, Huygens was launched uh, in 1997, but it didn't get there until 2004. So you can imagine there's a long time span where you just have to wait and have it just get there before it actually, actually start doing any work. Right. And uh, I've got one more question here. Um, other than finding new information, and, uh, and ensuring the safety of Earth. Why do we need to do space exploration? It's very interesting that, uh, you know, space actually affects us in many different ways in our daily life. And, and the, the fact that we have explored space so much, we have come up with technologies that we hadn't even thought about. Um, uh, you know, and we did not require it, you know, necessity is the mother inven of invention is kind of what we say is, is, you know, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So when the scientists were sending rovers to the moon, they required something um, that wasn't a very heavy camera. And, you know, if you look at the history of cameras, they were big and clunky, especially, you know, when they sent them to the moon. Um, they couldn't keep doing that because it costs a lot of money to be sending stuff to pay space. So what they did was they were able to come up with a miniature chip um, that was so small, but very high power um, or high resolution. Um, and, and, you know, those chips were then now I guess, being used in even just our camera. So every other camera, so all the cameras in the cell phones have a very small chip. Um, and one in two cameras actually have this chip that was originally developed for space exploration to basically send a, a camera to Mars. And so, you know, if you think about it, there are tons of these spin-offs as we call them um, that were, you know, we wouldn't have required to make cameras smaller for any reason here on earth. We required it to be make it smaller to send it to Moon and Mars, and so now we're backtracking and applying that to be helpful here on Earth. Um, and so, I think there are two things: things that it will be valuable for our knowledge because we humans are curious and want to just learn about where we are in the universe, and then at the same time, a lot of the uh, technologies that we use in exploration end up being used here on Earth in many many different ways. And so it's kind of a twofold. Our curiosity drives it, but then the innovation actually helps drive it more back here on Earth and helps us in our daily lives. So, you know, that's the two things is why we should keep exploring. Great. Well, my very last question as we wrap up, we're already over our time today. I'd love to ask you if you have any advice for any viewers today, any of these students who might think uh, they'd like to pursue a career in space exploration or, or research or any of these avenues, any of those positions that you showed as options to become involved. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, I think uh, my advice would be just be curious. And, you know, if, if you're passionate about that, you know, particular topic, make sure that you are investing time in learning more about it. Um, I know that a lot of people think you have to be super smart to be able to be, you know, doing these in your daily life. You don't. Um, you know, I would give my example. I was really passionate about astronomy from a very young age. And all I did was I just wanted to learn more. And I asked every person I could about, you know, what they knew about astronomy because I wanted to know about it. So as long as you're passionate, you want to achieve it and you're curious, I think that's kind of two things. Um, also, make sure you invest in looking for an, a mentor, you know, someone who is in the industry that you or area that you want to be and, you know, talk to them how you could get there where they are. Um, and I think that is very helpful. So those are, again, the two pieces of information.
Well, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Parshiti, for taking the time to tell us about Titan and uh, the Junior Astronaut Initiative. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone enjoyed and I hope you all will check out the Junior Astronauts Initiative. Yes, and for more information and activities from the Junior Astronaut Program, uh, you can just Google Junior Astronaut Canada and then click on the webpage with an address at uh, csa.gc.ca as the end there and, and you'll find your way and you can check out all the different activities that are available. Stay tuned for more information about webinars and other PIR educational programs at pirweb.org. And thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you have a great day.